how to furnish and decorate an eleven hundred dollar cottage by cosmos an article from the decorator and furnisher volume seventeen published december first eighteen ninety this is a librivox recording read in honor of the eleventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org how to furnish and decorate an eleven hundred dollar cottage we present our readers with an illustration of an ornamental cottage known as design number four in the illustrated atlas of sensible low-cost houses issued by the national architects union of philadelphia pennsylvania the estimated cost of which is one thousand one hundred dollars the perspective view presents a design which is at once pleasing and comfortable having a light graceful effect the two porches adding much to its beauty the double row of windows at one side adds much to the general appearance and the design has been selected as one of those which gives a great deal of comfort and pleasure as well as artistic effect for the small amount invested we also give illustrations of the first and second stories first story as will be seen the entrance opens into a large well-lighted hall from which the staircase is entirely curtained off and private the first room to the right of the hall is a study office or sewing room nine by nine the parlor twelve by fourteen is at the end of the hall and is a bright handsome room the dining room thirteen by fourteen opposite the entrance is a very pleasant room with an open fireplace and bay window it connects by a passageway with the kitchen twelve by fourteen which has a large passageway and is well lighted closets are arranged on either side of the passage second story this contains three bedrooms twelve by fourteen thirteen by fourteen and ten by twelve each with ample closet room such therefore is the style of house we have selected to furnish and decorate beginning with the dining room in the present article when the average man or woman takes possession of an empty house they are at their wits end to know how best to proceed to furnish the same so as to produce a maximum amount of artistic effect for a minimum expense if they allow their furnishings to be dictated by a professional dealer they will very easily run up big bills without the question of suitability or artistic merit in the articles purchased being very much considered they absolutely require the services of a conscientious professional decorator whose judgment can be purchased in their interest to guide them in furnishing their home the decorator and furnisher having during its eight years of existence been the standard of taste with regard to everything pertaining to the furnishing and adornment of the home supplies the place of the conscientious decorator by introducing a new feature namely the publication of decorative charts illustrating low-cost artistic methods of interior decoration accompanied by plans of rooms with suggestions for furniture upholstery designs carpets pictures and bric-a-brac these plans will be original designs and will be prepared by the most expert decorators in the country and their recommendations as to the correct styles and colorings of walls carpets upholstery fabrics and decorative draperies are alone worth ten times the cost of the subscription to our journal the furniture shown in the drawing room is designed in the romanesque style as applied to simple articles of furniture oak would be the most suitable wood to use perhaps stained slightly a warm brown with what is known to the trade as b walnut filler the tiles in the fireplace may be of any color 
from rich cream to a deep red or brown should brick facing be used dark red facial brick could be employed with good effect the burlap is intended to be of the natural color simply sized or shellacked or it may be decorated with gold bronze the frame for the glass and the mouldings should be of oak brass headed nails could be used around the burlap as a border with good effect the walls are decorated with plain ingrain the dado between the skirting and dado rail has the paper a citron tint the wall filler is yellow orange the frieze is a light gold ground with the ornament in citron emplevened with gold the ceiling is tinted a cream color and may have a border similar to that of the frieze this scheme of decoration with a yellow orange cream or ecru carpet would produce a simultaneous harmony of color the great idea in decoration being to harmonize the coloring of the more important space the chart is drawn to the scale of half an inch to the foot so as to facilitate its actual reproduction in our january issue we hope to give charts for the decoration of the parlor den and bedrooms of the cottage it may be stated that this department of the journal is in the hands of a practical decorator who is willing to act as agent for the purchase of furniture carpets wallpaper upholstery and drapery fabrics pictures and bric-a-brac and any of our readers entrusting their orders to him will be satisfied with the result remittances should in all cases accompany orders which should be made payable to the art trades publishing company publishers of the decorator and furnisher who will be responsible for the proper execution of the orders end of how to furnish and decorate an eleven hundred dollar cottage read by sue anderson Eleven Important Wild Duck Foods by W. L. McCaddy. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the eleventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction Accounts of the value, nature, range, and methods of propagation of various groups of plants having importance as wild duck foods are contained in a series of contributions of the Biological Survey to publications of the Department of Agriculture, of which this bulletin is the third. Eleven groups here discussed include two assemblages of freshwater plants of universal distribution in the United States, two of more southerly range, two trees of southern swamps whose abundant seeds are eagerly eaten by ducks, one strictly saltwater duck food, the first thus far recommended by the bureau one brackish water plant and three others of such luxuriant growth as to be especially adapted for use on duck farms musk grasses value as duck food parts of musk grasses algae cherisei have been found in the stomachs of the following fourteen species of ducks mallard black duck pintail widgeon gadwell green-winged and blue-winged teals bufflehead golden eye ruddy duck little and big bluebills ring-neck and redhead the small tubers of these plants are eaten in large numbers more than one thousand one hundred were contained in the stomach of one golden eye and more than fifteen hundred in that of a pintail however all parts of musk grasses are eaten certain ducks spending the late autumn on curatick sound north carolina were feeding extensively on these plants three-fifths of the food of seventy little and thirty-five big bluebills taken in that locality in november nineteen o nine consisted of musk grasses the stomachs of three pintails collected in the same locality in september contained on the average fifty-two per cent of musk grasses and of two in October, 90%. Musk grasses belong to the great group of plants known as algae, which include forms commonly known as frog spit, green slime, and seaweeds. 
most of the musk grasses cherisei live in fresh water and are among the most highly organized algae that do so they are attached to the bottom and over it often form a fluffy blanket a foot or more in thickness small round white tubers occur in numbers on the rhizoids root-like organs of some species the slender stems are jointed and bear at the joints whorls of fine tubular leaves which usually have a beaded appearance figure one due to the reproductive organs growing there these are of two sorts the antheridia which are spherical and red when mature and the oogonia which are ovoid and black more or less overlaid with white the oogonia correspond to the seeds of higher plants and are about half a millimeter in length these plants are translucent and fragile dull green in color and often encrusted with lime this has given them one of their common names lime weed other names are stonewort fine moss michigan oyster grass and nigger wool north carolina and skunk grass massachusetts the latter name and that here adopted for these plants namely musk grass refer to a strong odor given off by a mass of the plants when freshly taken from the water distribution probably no part of the united states entirely lacks representatives of chara or nitella our two genres of cherise they require lime however and hence reach their best development in regions where that mineral is plentiful propagation for transplanting musk grasses should be gathered in quantity in late summer or fall when some or all of the oogonia are mature for shipment they should be packed in small units as in berry crates open to the air on all sides this will prevent fermentation a little drying will not hurt if they are to be transported long distances the package should be iced for planting bunches of the plant may be weighted and dropped to the bottom growth should appear the following summer musk grasses will grow on almost any kind of bottom but it must be remembered that they will not thrive permanently in the absence of lime duckweeds value as duck food duckweeds are abundant only under special conditions but these conditions exist in some of the favorite haunts of our wild ducks in the still recesses of southern cypress swamps where duckweeds cover the entire water surface these plants contribute to the support of all species of wild ducks a statement of the duckweed content of two lots of stomachs collected at manesha arkansas in november and december will serve to show the importance of these plants in that locality in the first lot were eight mallards and duckweeds composed an average of more than sixty two per cent of their stomach contents the proportion of other species was as follows spoonbill one stomach fifty five per cent redhead ten fifty point three per cent and little bluebill six eight point three three per cent in the second lot were sixty four mallards and they had eaten duckweeds to the average extent of more than forty nine per cent fifteen ringnecks had consumed on the average twenty one point seven per cent each and two wood ducks ninety five per cent in the woodland ponds also of the northern states duckweeds abound here in the brooding season the wood duck still manifests its preference for these little plants some stomachs are filled exclusively with them thousands being present duckweeds are relished by most of our ducks and have been found in the stomachs of the following species additional to those above mentioned pintail gadwell black duck widgeon blue-winged and green-winged teals and big bluebill as duckweeds sink at the approach of cold weather they are available in the north during only the warmer months in the south however they remain at the surface practically all the year description of plants the duckweeds most commonly seen are the green discs sometimes more or less tailed on one side figure two a b c d which cover the surface of quiet and usually shaded waters these discs are really leaves the plants being reduced to a leaf with one or a few roots on the underside duckweeds multiply largely by budding and the parent plant and offsets often cling together in clusters 
individual plants vary in size from one twelfth to three fourths of an inch in diameter two genera of duckweeds lack roots one of these wolfia figure two e f contains the smallest flowering plants these appear as green granules one twenty-fourth of an inch or less in diameter and are often abundant among other duckweeds or about the margins of lakes and ponds when the hand is dipped into the water large numbers of the plants adhere to it they look like coarse meal except for their green color and feel like it so that a good name for them would be water meal the other genus of rootless duckweeds wolfiella consists of strap-shaped plants figure two g and h narrowed at one or both ends they are from one-fifth to three-fifths of an inch in length and commonly cohere in radiate bodies or in large masses of less definite structure duckweeds are known also as ducks meat water lentils and seed moss the latter term in fact is used in arkansas to cover all components of the vegetation of the water surface besides duckweeds this mass includes that green or red velvety moss-like plant azola caroliana and the branching strap-like liverworts richiella both of these are eaten by waterfowl along with the duckweeds but being less plentiful are of minor importance distribution most of the species of duckweeds are wide-ranging of the single-rooted kind lemna figure two c and d three species occur throughout the united states two others are confined to the southern part and one to the eastern the one many-rooted species spirodella figure two a b is of universal distribution the granule like rootless forms wolfia figure two e f so far as known are confined to the eastern half of the country and the strap-like rootless species wolfiella figure two g h to the southeastern quarter propagation the seeds of duckweeds are minute and seldom mature the plants therefore must be transplanted bodily there is no difficulty about this for if they are not crushed or allowed to ferment or dry duckweeds are perfectly at home from the moment they are placed in a new body of water fermentation may be prevented by shipping in small units freely exposed to the air plants which are to be transported a long distance should be iced it is useless to put duckweeds in large open bodies of water they thrive best in small pools and ditches where the water surface is rarely disturbed in ponds entirely surrounded by forest growth and wooded swamps duckweeds also abound but they are equally at home in small pools and other openings among the reeds and sedges of marshes they are strictly fresh-water plants frogbit value as duck food frogbit and the three species next described thalia water elm and swamp privet are at present known to be of only local importance as wild duck foods frogbit is an abundant inhabitant of some of the shallow cypress margined lakes in avoyel parish louisiana it produces spherical fruits filled with gelatinous matter in which are a multitude of seeds eagerly sought by ducks nearly eighteen per cent of the food of three hundred eight mallards collected in that locality from october to march inclusive consisted of these seeds from eight thousand to ten thousand were found in each of several stomachs and one contained thirty two thousand other ducks found feeding on frogbit seeds were the pintail and ring neck twenty five stomachs of the latter species collected in december contained on the average over thirty five per cent of these eagerly sought seeds description of plant frogbit limnobium spongia floats in shallow waters extending its roots into the muck below or it may grow on soft mud itself on stalks from a few inches to a foot in length are several heart-shaped leaves figure three which have five to seven longitudinal veins springing from the base and numerous cross veins the under side of the leaves is sometimes purplish numerous spongy runners help to support the plant in the water and they also form new plants at the joints the flowers emerge from conspicuous sheaths and appear to have three sepals which are broader and sometimes reflexed 
and three petals which are narrow and more erect the stamens six to twelve in number are given off at different heights from a central column the stalks supporting the berry-like fruits are thick and recurved the berry as previously noted is filled with a mixture of seeds and gelatinous substance the seeds are covered by minute tangled processes which cause them to cohere in masses the fruit ripens in august distribution frogbit is a local plant especially in the northern part of its range it has been found at braddock bay new york monmouth county new jersey and in delaware but the normal range probably is from north carolina and missouri southward the range here mapped figure four is not complete since the plant has been found in mexico propagation frogbit is extensively used in aquaria and water gardens and may be obtained from dealers in plants for such purposes the plants themselves should be set out in water a few inches deep over a mucky bottom or in soft mud near the water's edge thalia value as duck food the writer's only experience with thalia species de varicata as a wild duck food was on st vincent island florida here a slough filled with a tall growth of these elegant plants was a favorite resort of ducks especially mallards which could always be flushed from this place however at the time of the writer's visit only one bird was obtained and its stomach contained a few thalia seeds another mallard collected at a later date in the same place by the late dr r v pierce had fed almost exclusively on these large seeds and its gullet and gizzard were well filled by one hundred forty four entire seeds and fragments of others the evidence is sufficient to show that thalia has great possibilities as a wild duck food the seeds are large and nutritious and are borne in great abundance they ripen in july and august and are available to ducks throughout the winter if the water is not frozen over description of plant a single plant of thalia divericata is a stout one-leaved stalk from four to fifteen feet in height rising from a large tuber-like root and the stems are usually clustered figure five the leaf is much like that of canna is stalked and may measure five inches wide and fifteen inches long the top of the stalk divides and subdivides into a large fruiting head which may bear from two hundred to three hundred seeds the ultimate branches of the fruiting head are strongly zigzag the flowers and seeds are borne in husks each of which is formed by two purplish bracts one much larger than the other the oblong seeds figure six are plump and vary in length up to three-eighths of an inch they have thin closely fitting individual husks are slightly curved and bear numerous longitudinal rows of small irregular elevations which are lighter in color than the rest of the surface distribution thalia de vericata is native from florida to southern arkansas and texas and southward into mexico and doubtless it will thrive as far north as south carolina and missouri two other species de albata and barbata occur in the region from south carolina and missouri south to florida and texas their value as a duck food is unknown propagation Thalia can be propagated from either seeds or root stalks. The seeds have a thick shell, and the root stalks are massive, so that neither should be injured if transported with ordinary precautions. Thalia occurs in greatest abundance in muddy sloughs, but it will grow in open water from two to three feet deep. If planted directly into open water, root stalks should be used. Seeds should either be placed in shallow water or sprouted in a protected place and the young plants set out after they have attained some size water elm value as duck food that trees should produce food for wild ducks is at first thought surprising but many do as oaks thorns hollies ashes hackberries and others none is of more value for this purpose however than the water elm the most common wild duck in central louisiana is the mallard in fact it outnumbers all other species combined 
foods important to it therefore are the important duck foods of the region one hundred and seventy one mallards collected in the vicinity of mansura and marksville during october november and december had fed on the seeds of water elm to the extent of forty five point five per cent of their local subsistence the largest number of seeds taken by a single duck was upward of two hundred these tightly filled the whole gullet and gizzard other species of ducks seem to be fond of the seeds judging from smaller numbers examined from this region these include the black duck and the ring neck water elm seeds are eaten by arkansas mallards also description of plant the water elm thrives in swamps and on the margins of sluggish streams normally it grows in water which is permanently two to three feet deep but it survives prolonged inundation of much greater depth the tree seldom exceeds forty feet in height and twenty inches in diameter and usually is much smaller the bark is much like that of the hop hornbeam or ironwood and the leaves figure seven while obviously similar to those of our other elms are smaller and have blunter marginal serrations the water elm flowers very early from february to april and the fruit usually ripens and falls in a month or six weeks but occasionally is found on the trees as late as august the extreme length of a single specimen of the fruit is about a third of an inch it consists of a plump seed with a shiny blue-black coating enclosed in a burr-like hull figure seven which is ridged and provided with numerous fleshy projections the fruits which are very numerous drop into the water immediately upon or even before ripening seedlings figure eight come up by the thousand in midsummer and young plants in all stages of growth are abundant providing that for increase seed is the main dependence of the tree the water elm is also known in books as plainer tree and among the french-speaking people of louisiana as chataignier and charmil distribution the range figure nine of the water elm planera aquatica extends from the lower wabash valley in indiana to the river bottoms of eastern texas and from western tennessee and southeastern north carolina to florida propagation seeds of the water elm do not seem to be ripe at the time they usually fall the real ripening probably occurs as they lie in the water beneath the parent tree while it is difficult therefore to collect seeds in proper condition for planting young plants of water elm abound and if carefully lifted and packed should stand shipment well great care must be taken to prevent the roots from drying they should be embedded in balls of earth and sewn up in burlap transportation should be as rapid as possible and the young trees should be set out or healed in immediately upon receipt transplanting should be done when the trees are leafless swamp privet value as duck food the swamp privet is included principally on account of the testimony of numerous hunters as to its usefulness wood ducks in particular are said to feed extensively upon its seeds weeks before other species of ducks arrive these birds are abundant in the country where swamp privet grows and are said to consume most of the crop of seeds leaving little for other ducks the seeds have been found in numerous mallard stomachs but in quantity in only one description of plant swamp privet forestiera acuminata or bois blanc found in the same kinds of localities as the water elm is a smooth barked shrub sometimes a small tree usually with drooping stems which frequently take root at the tip the smooth light green leaves figure ten are opposite oval taper pointed at both ends and with rounded serrations which are more prominent on the apical half the fruit of swamp privet is a blue watery berry from one half to three fourths of an inch in length greatly subject to insect attack it is usually distorted the pit is nearly as long as the berry pointed at both ends and has numerous lengthwise fibrous ridges the seed within is white and smooth the flowers borne in clusters bloom in march and april 
and the fruit is ripe in may and june as is the case with seeds of the water elm those of the swamp privet may remain under water for a long period without apparent deterioration probably most of the seeds are exposed by the annual lowering of the water level and germinate the summer they are produced see figure eleven whether those which fall in deeper water ever germinate is unknown but it is certain so far as utility as duck food is concerned that they keep in perfect condition far into the succeeding spring distribution swamp privet is native from central illinois and tennessee near nashville south to texas and florida see figure twelve propagation fruits of swamp privet fully ripen upon the tree the seeds being protected by a fibrous cover and the pulp of the berry undoubtedly will stand shipment for ordinary distances prompt handling is advisable however and the usual precautions against fermentation should be taken the seeds should be sown in well-watered beds and the young plants grown to some size before setting out collected young plants and the offshoots produced by the rooting of the tips of branches of older ones may be handled like those of the water elm eel grass value as duck food few who have written of the habits of sea brand have failed to mention its fondness for eel grass the relation between this species of bird and plant seems to be as close as if not closer than that existing between the noted freshwater pair the canvasback duck and wild celery so far as investigations of the food of the brant are concerned the published record is thoroughly substantiated all normal stomach contents of the common brant thus far examined consisted exclusively of eel grass other salt-water fowl also feed on eel grass as the surf and white-winged scoters six birds of the latter species collected at natarts bay oregon had made forty three per cent of their last meal of it the list of other ducks feeding on the plant includes the golden eye old squaw bufflehead mallard and black duck the last named species sometimes devouring the seeds of eel grass in large numbers the stomachs of five black ducks collected at amityville long island new york in october and november contained on the average more than sixty six per cent of eel grass seeds the number of seeds per stomach varying from seven hundred to four thousand eleven birds taken at scarborough maine during the same months had eaten enough eel grass seeds to make up fifty one per cent of their food in three cases fully two thousand seeds had been taken thirteen ducks of the same species collected in massachusetts in january and february had taken eel grass including both seeds and leaves to the extent of more than eleven per cent of their food the widgeon a species which prefers foliage to the seeds and roots of aquatic plants sometimes visits salt water to feed upon this plant five of these birds taken at south island south carolina in february had made one-fourth of their meal of the leaves of eel grass description of plant eel grass zostera marina consists of bunches of long tape-like leaves which rise from a jointed fibrous rooted creeping stem figure thirteen the leaves bear a strong superficial resemblance to those of wild celery but they are rarely more than a fourth of an inch wide while those of wild celery are seldom as narrow the leaf of eel grass furthermore is tougher and more leathery than that of wild celery when a mature leaf is torn across numerous white fibers may be seen at the broken ends wild celery lacks these the color of eel grass leaves is olive or dark green that of wild celery clear light green the leaves grow in small bundles from the end of the rootstock or its branches and may reach a length of six feet the rootstocks which usually are reddish have joints about every half inch at which they are easily broken the numerous fibrous roots spring from these joints seeds of eel grass are formed in sheaths alongside the leaves they are about one-eighth of an inch in length are placed end to end and are barrel-shaped with the surface conspicuously longitudinally ribbed figure fourteen eel grass has numerous common names 
among which we may cite sea rack or grass rack sea sweet barnacle turtle and widgeon grass distribution eel grass is strictly a maritime species in its natural habitat it is cosmopolitan in north america it is found from greenland to the gulf of mexico and from alaska to california propagation this plant grows only in salt water it is common along shores facing the open ocean but also grows in bays and even lagoons where the water must be far less salt than the sea the seeds are not well protected against drying and for that reason are unsuitable for transplanting moreover unless they can be sown in a very quiet place the chances are against securing a catch the rootstocks however are rather tough and resistant and furthermore can be fastened to the bottom they must not be allowed to dry but should be shipped wet and handled as rapidly as possible bury or fasten to the bottom in water a few feet deep where there is little surf once established the plant will spread to more exposed areas widgeon grass value as duck food widgeon grass is of rather restricted range but of considerable importance as a duck food almost everywhere it grows in no locality so far as known is it more important than on the coast of texas here the bays that have kept their widgeon grass have kept their ducks those in which the plant has been destroyed by influxes of mud and filling up of inlets have lost them at rockport texas widgeon grass still holds its own and is the main dependence of the visiting vegetarian ducks about sixty four per cent of the food of thirty three pintails collected at rockport in december was made up of rootstocks leaves and seeds of widgeon grass this plant furnished also two-thirds of the food of three widgeons and more than fifty-four per cent of that of thirty-seven redheads taken at the same time records of the food of ducks on st vincent island florida show two other species of ducks to be very fond of this grass nineteen little bluebills collected in january had eaten it primarily the seeds to the extent of over sixty-three per cent of their food the number of seeds per stomach varying from five hundred to four thousand the food of seventeen gadwells taken at the same time and place was eighty four per cent widgeon grass and the stomach of a redhead contained about five thousand one hundred twenty seeds most of the duck stomachs received by the biological survey from south island south carolina have contained widgeon grass it composed forty one per cent of the food of three blue winged teals collected there in march and twenty seven per cent of that of eight gadwells obtained in february and march in currituck sound north carolina widgeon grass grows among too great a profusion of other valuable duck foods to have the importance attained in less favored localities nevertheless it is a plant of considerable value practically ten per cent of the food of thirty-five big bluebills collected there in november was composed of widgeon grass as was about the same proportion of the diet of seventy little bluebills at back bay virginia seventeen per cent of the food of nine pintails collected in february consisted of widgeon grass and at virginia city virginia sixteen per cent of the food of fourteen mallards taken in january was of the same composition other ducks found feeding on widgeon grass are the florida duck black duck green winged and cinnamon teals spoonbill canvasback ringneck bufflehead old squaw ruddy duck surf scoter and hooded merganser description of plant widgeon grass rupia maritima is similar in habit to sago pondweed or foxtail both have long slender filamentous leaves on widely spreading much branched stems in widgeon grass the basal parts of many of the leaves are enlarged see figure fifteen and this upon close inspection gives the plant quite a different appearance from sago pondweed the seeds of sago pondweed are compactly grouped on a central axis while those of widgeon grass are borne singly on rather long stalks which radiate from the top of the fruiting peduncle figure sixteen the latter organ usually is spirally coiled in widgeon grass in sago pondweed it never has more than a simple curve 
the root stock of widgeon grass is tougher than that of sago pondweed more frequently jointed and often angled at the joints there are no tubers the seeds are black rounded triangular in outline with a small pit on each side near the apex and on one edge an oblong lid which is forced out during germination pondweed seeds have a similar lid but are usually larger than those of widgeon grass never black and lack the apical pits widgeon grass is usually referred to in books as sea or ditch grass it is also called tassel grass tassel weed tassel pondweed nigger wool poldew grass and peter grass the last two names are compounded from terms by which the coot is known in southern states and indicate that widgeon grass is highly relished by that bird distribution widgeon grass is a brackish water plant it grows in salt water but probably never in that of full ocean strength it also grows in water that passes for fresh as in the upper part of currituck sound north carolina but inlets from the ocean to this part of the sound have existed in recent years and high tides at times cross the narrow beach salt in the soil or salt springs even if covered by fresh water also give widgeon grass the conditions necessary for existence this explains its scattering distribution in the interior of the country figure seventeen along the coasts widgeon grass occurs from the base of the alaska peninsula and the gulf of st lawrence south to central america propagation widgeon grass may be propagated from the seeds which ripen in late summer and early autumn these should be gathered with about six inches of the upper part of the plant as the foliage tends to keep them from drying this material should not be packed in large masses but free circulation of air should be provided to prevent fermentation as little time as possible should intervene between gathering and planting if it is desired to keep the seeds for some time they may be placed in wet cold storage after soaking the seed until it will sink so broadcast in quiet but not stagnant water over mud bottom widgeon grass grows in water varying in depth from a few inches to ten feet it should be sown where the water is permanently one to two feet deep three plants for duck farms the plants considered under this head are distinguished by rankness of vegetative growth comparative unimportance of their seeds as duck food and lack of fleshly rootstocks and tubers these qualities render the plants generally undesirable for propagation as wild duck foods but they are the very things which make them valuable for duck farms as a rule abundant green food is available to wild ducks but the birds usually have to search for seeds fruits tubers and like forms of concentrated nutriment the conditions on a game farm are just the reverse the birds are supplied grain food constantly but need roughage particularly of naturally suitable kinds plants of rapid luxuriant growth are necessary and all requirements are fulfilled by watercress water weed and coontail use of these plants the three plants just mentioned are not recommended for planting in waters where any other growth is desired since they are such rank growers that they are apt to take complete possession one of them namely coontail has considerable value as a wild duck food however and may be tried in waters where other plants have failed on duck farms best results will be obtained if the unit system of ponds be adopted ducks can be turned into one pond at a time and when a pond is eaten out it may be re-sown screened off and allowed to make a new crop under favorable conditions waterweed and coontail will grow six inches a day watercress value as duck food knowledge of the importance of watercress as a duck food is derived entirely from breeders of wild ducks who almost without exception consider it a valuable plant for a duck farm not only is it relished but it is said to grow so fast in some places that the ducks cannot eat it out description of plant watercress cecimbrium nasturtium aquaticum either floats on the water rooted only at the lower end or creeps along on mud or in shallow water throwing out roots at every joint it is a smooth fleshy plant 
with divided leaves and small white flowers figure eighteen the leaves consist of three to nine symmetrically arranged oval or roundish segments of which the apical of each leaf is the largest the pods vary from one half to one and one fourth inches in length and are slightly curved and contain numerous small seeds there is a constant succession of flowers and pods throughout the growing season the plant sometimes is strongly tinged with olive brown suggesting one of its common names brown cress other names are well cress or grass water curs cars cars or grass crashes and brook lime distribution watercress occurs practically throughout the united states propagation watercress usually is propagated by seed this may be obtained from most seedsmen the plant is also easily transplanted by cuttings it grows in springs brooks small streams and shallow ponds waters in which it is found are usually cool and have some current it may be sown in similar situations at any time during spring or summer water weed value as duck food evidence for the value of water weed is of the same nature as for watercress the density and luxuriance of its growth are such that water weed maintains its stand even when fed upon daily by a large number of ducks small quantities of the plant have been found in stomachs of the mallard blue-winged teal and golden eye description of plant water weeds figures nineteen and twenty have long branching stems with luxuriant foliage and are of a beautiful translucent green color the leaves which are set upon the stem in whorls of from two to four usually three vary from ovate to strap shaped and may be pointed or obtuse and are sometimes finely toothed they are from one fourth to one inch or more in length and from one twelfth to one eighth of an inch in width the small flowers are borne on rather long stalks and open at the surface of the water the fruit which is rare is few seeded and ripens under water this plant was introduced into great britain in the middle of the nineteenth century and spread rapidly making such rank growth that it soon became a pest filling ornamental waters mill races and canals it became known there as american waterweed and babington's curse because introduced by a botanist of that name other names applied to the plant are ditch moss water thyme thyme weed cat's tails and choke pond weed some botanists consider that there are several different species of water weed in the united states but having in mind the entirely different aspect wild plants of water weed assume when transferred to an aquarium one is inclined to think that differences in the forms which have been thought to represent different species may be largely due to conditions under which the plants are grown water weed has had various scientific names applied to it and the following may be encountered in trade catalogues philotria elodea and anacharis the specific name that has been most commonly used in this country is canadensis dealers in aquarium plants usually list a form of water weed known as anacharsis canadensis gigantea distribution water weeds grow naturally throughout most of north america propagation water weed propagates itself from pieces of leafy stem or root it is tenacious of life and if shipment in good condition is achieved no trouble will be experienced in obtaining a stand of the plant bury the roots or bases of stems in the bottom in shallow water for quick results the plant will grow however if only thrown in water shallow enough three feet or less to allow it to send roots to the bottom it likes a loam or sandy bottom and does not grow in clay either still or running waters are suitable when established it will spread to water up to ten feet in depth coontail value as duck food the seeds of coontail are eaten by practically all wild ducks but the foliage by a much smaller number and less frequently ducks known to feed on this plant are the following hooded merganser mallard black duck florida duck gadwell widgeon green-winged and blue-winged teals spoonbill pintail wood duck redhead canvasback 
little and big bluebills ring-neck golden eye buffle-head old squaw white-winged scoter ruddy duck and the whistling swan the following instances show the local value of coontail to some of these species of ducks about thirty per cent of the food of one hundred seventy one mallards collected about mansura and marksville louisiana from october to december consisted of coontail and as many as one hundred fifty seeds were found in a single stomach much more than the ordinary proportion of stems and leaves of the plant were taken by these birds another illustration of foliage eating is furnished by eight mallards and one black duck collected at big lake arkansas in december nineteen twelve more than eighty five per cent of the food of the mallards was made up of the foliage of coontail with a few seeds while ninety per cent of the black duck's food consisted exclusively of coontail foliage sixty four mallards collected at manesha arkansas in november and december nineteen o nine had fed on coontail seeds to the extent of seven point two three per cent of their diet fourteen of the same species of duck taken at lake wapanoka arkansas in november nineteen ten had eaten enough seeds with a little foliage of coontail to form on the average more than half of their food the plant thus has considerable local value as a wild duck food however its tendency to crowd out more desirable species makes transplanting unwise unless in particularly difficult cases where other plants have failed the very qualities of coontail that make it a nuisance in natural waters commend it to duck farmers description of plant the stems of coontail ceratophyllum demersum are thickly clothed with round dense masses of foliage figures twenty one and twenty two which in shape amply justify the common name so widely used in the south and which is here adopted for the plant coontail is a submerged plant but only exceptionally is it attached to the bottom as it has no roots it usually grows in rather quiet waters from two to ten feet deep the leaves are composed of slender but rather stiff filaments twice or thrice forked and sparingly furnished with small acute projections they grow in whorls of from five to twelve and are usually much crowded on the upper part of the stem the fruit of coontail figure twenty three is composed of a rather large flattened seed wedge-shaped at one end and rounded at the other enclosed in a thin covering which bears various tubercles on the surface and spines on the margin a common form has one spine at the apex and one at each basal angle of the fruit one may examine many plants without finding fruit nevertheless the frequency with which ducks find it proves that a good crop is produced coontail is known also as hornwort hornweed morassweed coontail moss fish blankets and june grass distribution coontail is practically cosmopolitan and occurs throughout all but the extreme northern parts of north america propagation pieces of coontail broken off from the parent plant promptly make new colonies a characteristic which makes transplanting easy care need be taken only to see that the plants do not lose their vitality either through drying or fermentation during shipment plant in quiet water as the plant has no roots it is enabled to thrive over hard or sandy bottoms where many other plants cannot establish themselves end of eleven important wild duck foods by w l mccaddy Eleven Out from Solitaire and Patience by George Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the eleventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shuffle two packs together lay out twelve packets of eight cards each as shown in the tableau the top cards being exposed the others face downward the remaining eight cards are all exposed singly and form the dummy hand 
having done this you look at the cards before you for any two which when added together will make eleven as seven and four eight and three etc these you remove as also picture cards when they form a sequence of knave queen king you then turn up the top cards of the uncovered packets and search out the elevens as before when no more cards can be worked off you may have recourse to the dummy hand from which you may take one card that makes eleven with one on the packets in the case of a sequence if there is only one kind of picture card on the packets and the remaining two in the dummy you may then remove both but should there be two face cards upon the packets which would complete the sequence with one from the dummy these two must be taken instead of a possible two from the dummy and one from the packets when there are two exposed cards of the same signification you may look at the card immediately underneath to see which would be most advisable to take the longer the dummy hand can be kept intact the greater will be the chance of working off the patience end of eleven out by george hapgood the eleventh hour by the new york telephone company this is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the eleventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eleventh Hour, with the compliments of the New York Telephone Company, as a souvenir of your trip behind the scenes in a telephone central office, 1914. This book tells in story and picture the inside history of Mrs. Douglas's party. Newspaper Clipping Mr. and Mrs. R. Gordon Douglas entertained informally on Friday in honor of Mrs. Douglas's sister, Mrs. Charles Picard Turner of Baltimore, who arrived in New York on Friday morning on her way to St. Moritz. Dinner was served at the Douglas home, number 420 West 72nd Street. The guests were Mr. and Mrs. James T. Townsend, Dr. and Mrs. Mortimer W. Ripley, and Mrs. Douglas's brother, Spence Norman. After dinner the guests went to the Casino Theatre. Mrs. Turner sailed Saturday on the Mauritania. The Eleventh Hour. Just a little party. Dinner for eight and the theatre, but they didn't start to plan it until nearly noon, and then there was so much to be done. The guests had to be invited, dinner had to be ordered, and theater tickets had to be bought. Mr. and Mrs. R. Gordon Douglas easily solved the problem. They simply took the telephone into their confidence, made their arrangements over the wire, and gave a successful dinner party. There's nothing particularly unusual in that. It is exactly what you or anybody else would have done under the circumstances. But back of this story, of a party arranged by telephone, is another story, of absorbing interest to every telephone user. It is the story of the vast organization and the delicate apparatus that make each call possible. The story of a world of unseen wonders. What goes on in this world, the flashes of signals, the spoken words, the constant tests and care taken to maintain a great system of communication, is practically unknown to you. You see very little of it, except the handy instrument on your table or on the wall. You hear only the cheerful voice that asks, Number, please. So we will lift the curtain and take you behind the scenes in the central telephone office while Mrs. Douglas's dinner party is being arranged. We will follow each call and describe briefly some of the central office apparatus that is called into play. So rapid and varied is the action at central that we will tell the story as nearly as possible in the form of a motion picture. We will show the relation between the story and the pictures by means of blackface type. New York City is here chosen as the scene of the action, but the story of how telephone calls are handled and the description of the telephone central office apply with but slight variation throughout the whole Bell system. The actors in this drama behind the scenes are real persons, they take part in thousands of similar dramas every day in the year. Only the people at the ends of the wires, Mr. and Mrs. Douglas and their friends, change each time. 
because this story is so much the same every time a call is made, because you yourself have been frequently in the position of Mr. and Mrs. Douglas in making use of the telephone as a time-saver, we believe you will find in it a personal interest. Here you will see how the local and long-distance operators weave the ever-changing web of conversation. You will watch the switchboard electricians at work. You will visit information, and the trouble operator, and the wire chief, as he guards the system against interruption of service. And through it all you will see the spirit of service, the spirit that directs the loyal, dependable work behind the scenes, so that you too, if you wish, may arrange your parties at the eleventh hour by telephone. The characters in this little chapter of everyday life are Mr. R. Gordon Douglas, a broker, P.B.X., the private switchboard attendant in his office, Mrs. R. Gordon Douglas, the hostess, Mrs. Charles Picard Turner, her sister, the guest of honor, Monsieur Francois Morier, the chef of the occasion, Dr. Mortimer W. Ripley, a guest, Mr. James T. Townsend, a guest, Mr. John T. Harrison, a friend in Albany, Mr. Lewis Bennett, at the box office, telephone operators at Central, the trouble operator, information, long distance, wire chief, outside trouble man, etc., all behind the scenes. Had the conference lasted one minute less, or had the elevator stopped one floor less on its upward trip, Mr. R. Gordon Douglas would have talked with Mrs. Douglas, instead of finding the note from her on his desk. Note. Friday, 11 a.m. Mr. Douglas. Mrs. Douglas wants you to call her up as soon as you get in. H.R.C. Eleven o'clock, and a raft of work piled up ahead. But business had been waiting on Mrs. Douglas for eight years, and it must wait again. Mrs. Douglas simply must be called. As he removes the telephone receiver, a signal shows on the switchboard in his office exchange. This signal is on his line, and the connection may be made through a hole or jack in the upper part of the board. Brass-tipped cords, grouped in pairs, are used to form the connections between two office telephones, or between the office and the great outside world. Upon receiving the signal from Mr. Douglas, his telephone attendant inserts a back plug in the jack corresponding to the number of Mr. Douglas's extension, and throws a switch so that she may talk to him. Number, please, she asks, so that she may know to whom he wants to talk. Riverside 22480, says Mr. Douglas. This is a call outside of the office, and we will follow that call through the maze of telephone equipment until it reaches Mrs. Douglas in her home miles away. His operator, who, as will be seen, is called PBX in official parlance, picks up the plug in front of the one now connecting with Mr. Douglas's telephone, and plugs into a trunk line leading to the telephone central office. Immediately a tiny electrical current passes from the private switchboard over the trunk line wire to the central telephone office, flashing down an insulated wire to a cable box, where it enters a main cable that covers that section of the street. Several hundred pairs of wires, leading from as many separate telephones, are bound up in this lead-encased cable, which runs from the cable box down into the ground. Thousands of miles of copper wire, really the most valuable copper mine in existence, are carried in cables under the streets of a city. These heavy cables are far too many and too heavy to run overhead on poles or supports. They are deep in the earth and are reached through covered manholes, placed as conveniently as possible, usually at street corners. Through seemingly endless conduits, these heavy cables lead directly to the central office, located in the very heart of the district it serves. In this case the wires are leading to the Spring Telephone Central Office, because Mr. Douglas's office telephone is Spring 43250. They enter the telephone building through a corridor called the cable vault in the basement. Pictured here is a group of these cables as they leave the street. Each is carefully numbered so that it may be properly identified. Order is the first command behind the scenes. 
up through the walls they go to distributing frames where the thousands of pairs of wires may be carefully arranged so that the connections may be made in an orderly manner here on the distributing frames enormous racks ceiling high and filling a large room the many wires are separated each pair to go its way this room is fireproof and moisture proof so that nothing can injure the delicate wires or interfere with their messages each wire has its own fuse providing against damage by an overcharge of electricity such a charge only burns the individual fuse thus central and the telephone user at the other end of the wire are protected all of these wires are readily accessible permitting electricians to work on them easily and quickly the wires carrying the message to this point are here joined to another pair leading to the central switchboard joining these pairs of wires is a delicate and thorough operation for unless they are perfectly and tightly fastened together the message would be hindered or interrupted constant supervision and careful examination are given to this very important detail as well as every other detail inside and outside the telephone central office the equipment employed in handling the particular call now being followed represents thousands of dollars and millions of cares appreciated only when one realizes how many calls have to be answered promptly and properly during every hour of the day sometimes a condition arises where part of the switchboard becomes overloaded by an unusually large number of calls to correct this overloading some of the lines must be transferred to another part of the board this change is made possible by an intermediate distributing frame where any series of wires may be switched about the second and third pictures show how this work is quickly done both the distributing and the intermediate distributing frames are under the direction of expert electricians the call now approaches the switchboard through what is technically known as a relay which operates and automatically lights a tiny signal lamp in front of central showing her that a call demands immediate attention the b board has a long row of single cords instead of pairs of cords as on the a board each one of these cords is connected back through a trunk line to a numbered jack on the a board of some other central office each one is numbered and each has a tiny signal lamp connected with it which signals b to disconnect when a has disconnected in this case b picks up the plug of 46 trunk which is idle and assigns this trunk number to a at the same instant she tests the line being called by touching the tip of the plug to the sleeve of the subscriber's jack if the line being called is busy she hears a click in her receiver which informs her of that fact if the line is not busy she plugs in now the a operator back in the spring central office now plugs her front cord into the jack which is the terminus of forty six trunk leading to the b board at riverside central office this connects mr douglas's telephone straight through both central offices to riverside two two four eight zero, the number he is calling mr douglas has been holding the line and is therefore ready to talk as soon as mrs douglas answers riverside two two four eight zero, she says answering with her number in order that the person calling her may be sure that he has the right number and may state his message without delay hello helen mr douglas recognizes his wife's voice immediately and he starts speaking to her just twenty-five seconds after he took his receiver off the hook hello dear mrs douglas answers dorothy is here and you know she sails for europe tomorrow i'd like to give her a little dinner before she sails mr douglas agrees and suggests a theatre party he makes notes of the arrangements as they decide upon them note call maurier dinner for eight six thirty jimmy townsend doc ripley spence norman jack harrison tickets for casino i'll see that everything is arranged says mr douglas all right dear and be sure to come up early good-bye they both hang up their receivers instantly a white signal on the private branch exchange board tells pbx that mr douglas has hung up she disconnects pulling out the two cords and allowing them to drop back into place 
A sees the little lamps associated with the cords light, and knows that that conversation is finished, so she disconnects. As soon as B sees the signal lamp on her board light, she disconnects too, allowing the cords to fall back into place. All of these operators, PBX, A, and B, disconnect at almost the same time, as soon as Mr. Douglas and his wife have hung up. This clears the line for future calls. Only two minutes have elapsed since Mr. Douglas entered his office. And now to arrange for the dinner party. I'll make sure of the dinner anyhow, says Mr. Douglas to himself, as he lifts the receiver to call Francois Morier, the caterer. Number, please, says PBX. Mr. Douglas asks for information. Morier has opened a new establishment, and his new telephone number is not yet in the directory. But Mr. Douglas can get the new number at once. PBX connects with the operator at the A board as before. A answers, and PBX asks for information. A promptly plugs in on a special jack which connects Mr. Douglas directly with information. Answering questions is not a part of the work of the operators who are usually known as central. All calls of this nature are handled by a special department. It is known as information, as all branches of the telephone exchange have the simplest possible names, for the convenience of the public and of the operators who handle the calls. Information will tell you the telephone number of an apartment house, or the number of a residence, if you can supply the name of the party living there. She can give you the telephone number of a friend you may wish to call in a distant city. The information operator has records of telephone numbers, listed by street address, records of listings against telephone numbers, and records showing changes in numbers or the disconnection of telephones. The information records are kept up to date easily, as they are typewritten in loose-leaf books which can be revised at any time. Information answers, This is information. Mr. Douglas gives her the name of Francois Morier and his approximate address. One moment, please, says information cheerfully. He holds the wire. She takes down the address record of telephones and turns to the page on which Monsieur Morier's address appears. The picture shows the record as she has it. The number, she finds, is Gramercy 51287. She gives the number to Mr. Douglas, in case he may wish to make a memorandum of it for future calls, and then signals A by moving the listening key back and forth. Gramercy 51287, she repeats, giving A the number which Mr. Douglas is calling. A repeats the number, so that information may know that she has it correctly, and then disconnects information from the calling line. A holds the front plug, which she has just disconnected from the line to information, in her hand, while she passes the number on to the B operator in the Gramercy Central Office. B assigns an idle trunk line to A and tests the line by touching the sleeve of the jack with the tip of the plug. She finds that that line is not busy and plugs in. A promptly plugs into the assigned trunk on her board, back in the spring central office. This part of the operation is precisely the same as when Mr. Douglas called his wife a few minutes ago. It is repeated in a city like New York about two million times a day. But this time the bell of Monsieur Morier's telephone does not ring. A watches the signal lamp and sees that Monsieur Morier does not answer immediately. Perhaps there is something wrong somewhere. There is, but the trouble is soon remedied. One of the electricians in the Gramercy Central Office hears an alarm bell ring, an automatic signal of trouble. On examination, he discovers that a shutter on a certain annunciator drop has fallen, which indicates that an excess current has blown out the generator fuse on B's position thus preventing the current from reaching and ringing M. Morier's bell. The automatic ringing apparatus, meanwhile, continues to send the current out over this interrupted circuit every few seconds. Consequently, as soon as the new fuse is in place, the bell will ring. The location of the fuse is indicated on the plate in the back of the shutter. Immediately the electrician goes to the side of the frame where the fuses are inserted, and replaces the blown-out fuse with a new one. 
since any fuse trouble is indicated at once by the ringing of the alarm bell making whatever repairs are necessary is a matter of seconds any accident is reported automatically but as a matter of fact cases of real trouble occur very seldom repairmen are constantly on the watch for anything that might endanger the equipment or interrupt the service in this way no serious accident can put a line out of order without its being detected in a very short time the first picture shows the method of putting the new fuse in the place of the one which has been burned out the trouble has been discovered so quickly that the fuse is replaced before any unusual delay is experienced in the response of m maurier his bell starts to ring as soon as the fuse is replaced and he answers at once maurier's m maurier answers which assures mr douglas that he has the right number this is a courteous and time-saving way to answer the telephone it saves much of the time which the exchange of hellos wastes and allows the conversation to start at once this is mr douglas speaking four twenty west seventy-second street can you serve a dinner for eight to-night m maurier assures him that he can take care of the dinner very nicely he suggests the menu and makes a memorandum of the various dishes and of the time the dinner is to be served in Mr. Douglas's home at 6.30. Mr. Douglas hangs up, Maurier hangs up, and PBX disconnects. A and B both disconnect, as usual. Mr. Douglas's clock points to just seven minutes past eleven, when he takes up his receiver to call Dr. Ripley. Instantly the white signal of extension three flashes up on the private switchboard, PBX knows that Mr. Douglas is calling again. She plugs in on jack number three with one of her inside plugs and pushes the listening key. Number, please, she asks. Schuyler 53417, says Mr. Douglas, giving the number of Dr. Ripley's telephone. Three seconds later, PBX has signaled to A in the Spring Central office, and A has plugged in to answer. Mr. Douglas, while he makes it a practice to have PBX secure his connections for him through the central office, has adopted the courteous practice of holding the wire while she gets the connection. Number, please, asks the A operator. Schuyler 53417, repeats PBX. A presses a button that connects her with the B operator in the Schuyler central office, which is in another part of the city. Meanwhile, she holds the front plug in readiness to insert it in the trunk line that B assigns to her. B assigns a trunk, and when she tests that line by touching the plug to the sleeve of the jack, she hears a click in the head receiver which rests lightly against her ear, and which all telephone operators wear, in order that both of their hands may be free for work all the time. This click tells her that Dr. Ripley's telephone— Schuyler 53417, is busy. In order to inform A that the line being called is already in use, she inserts the plug into the busy jack at the bottom of the board, which gives an automatic signal back to A, who tells PBX that that line is busy, while preparing to disconnect. Please call me when you get them, asks PBX. A promises to do so, and notes down on a specially printed ticket which has previously been dated, the number calling, the number called, the abbreviation BY, and the time of day. She then crosses the ticket to indicate that no connection has been made, and writes the capital letter C in the upper right-hand corner, which signifies that the calling party has requested her to complete the connection as soon as possible. She has previously written her initials over the date which appears on the ticket. This ticket is known as a busy ticket. It provides a memorandum of what A has been asked to remember. All of the records and memoranda used in the central office are designed to make the service as perfect as possible, and also to make the operators part of the work as simple as is consistent with the proper working of the system. PBX tells Mr. Douglas that Dr. Ripley's telephone is busy, and he hangs up. PBX now disconnects as also does A. A continues to call the number every few minutes, until she finds it free. She will call PBX when the connection with Schuyler 53417 is made. 
Mr. Douglas, however, almost immediately takes up his receiver to call another number. This time it is Mr. Townsend, the next guest on the list. Plaza 49140, he tells PBX when she has answered. PBX plugs in to reach A, as usual, through one of the central office trunk lines and repeats the number. A answers in the usual way, and at once passes the call on to the B operator at the Plaza Central Office. The distance between the Plaza Central Office and the Spring Central Office is several miles. However, so complete is the system of wiring between the different central offices that the connection to the B board at Plaza is made with no more difficulty than if it were in the same building. B assigns a trunk and tests Mr. Townsend's line by touching the plug of the trunk line inside the sleeve of that jack. But this time she hears a peculiar noise, which indicates to her that the line is out of order. So instead of plugging in, she connects up with the trouble operator by plugging in on another jack before her. Every telephone exchange has its own trouble operator. Trouble occurs but seldom, but when something does go wrong it must be fixed without delay. Trouble sits at a position at the B board and has facilities for determining whether or not lines are out of order. She finds out from Mr. Douglas what number he is calling. He promptly gives the number again, realizing that it must be needed for some good reason. Trouble then tests that called line by connecting it up with her voltmeter, which shows whether anything is wrong with the line. She finds that something is wrong, and reports to Mr. Douglas that Plaza 49140 is out of order. She then signals A, and gives the report. All parties disconnect. Here's the trouble. Mr. Townsend's six-year-old daughter has been playing with the telephone. She has been a little puzzled by the sounds which she has heard over it, without being able to see any person speaking anywhere around but at last she has become tired of playing at telephoning, and has left the instrument with the receiver hanging off the hook. Naturally this prevented the bell from ringing, and thus stopped the use of the line. The little girl doesn't know how much her play has interfered with the telephone service. After Trouble has reported that Mr. Townsend's line is out of order, A endeavors to complete the connection with Dr. Ripley's number, the number which had previously been reported busy. She passes the number on to B again, in the Schuyler Central office. B assigns an idle trunk, tests the line, and plugs in, while A plugs in on her end of the connecting trunk line. When Dr. Ripley answers, A tells him that she has a call for him, and asks him to hold the wire. Then she calls Mr. Douglas's office by ringing 43250. One of the electric shutters on his private switchboard drops. This signals to PBX that a call is coming in on one of the main trunk lines. Picking up one of the front plugs, she inserts it in the trunk line jack directly under the shutter that says Douglas and Company. Do you still want Schuyler 53417? asks A. Yes, thank you, PBX answers. She plugs in on Mr. Douglas's extension with the other cord and presses the button that rings his bell. This calls Mr. Douglas to the telephone at the same time that A is connecting. Mr. Douglas speaking, he answers. He talks to Dr. Ripley and invites him to the dinner. Dr. Ripley accepts for himself and his wife. Mr. Douglas's clock says ten minutes after eleven, and already he has invited two guests and called the caterer. But he has still not received a connection with Mr. Townsend. When Dr. Ripley and Mr. Douglas hang up their receivers, PBX disconnects. A and B also disconnect. This leaves both of the lines free for incoming and outgoing calls. Because of the frequency of calls, and the speed at which they are handled, prompt action is necessary at Central in disconnecting as well as in connecting the lines. Mr. Townsend's telephone, Plaza 49140, that has afforded amusement for his little six-year-old daughter, has been reported to trouble for a steady signal, which is the official way of saying that it gives a steady signal before the A operator. This means that either the receiver is off the hook, or that some trouble on the lines is causing this condition. Trouble has plugged into a line with a howler plug, from which a peculiar form of current is sent into Mr. Townsend's receiver. 
this produces a shrill, insistent noise in the receiver, which brings Mr. Townsend to the spot at once. He sees the difficulty and hangs up the receiver. The noise stops. The trouble operator receives a lamp signal showing that the receiver has been put back in place, and knowing that the line is all right again, she disconnects the howler. PBX, shortly after this, calls Mr. Townsend's number again. "'Number, please,' says the A operator, as she answers the call by plugging in with her front cord. "'Plaza 49140,' says PBX. A repeats it, brightly and cheerfully. No matter how many times a day she repeats the old familiar, "'Number, please,' and the names of the various central offices, she is always courteous, always obliging. That is one reason for the efficiency of the system, because Central is ready to do her best all the time. Once again, A passes on the number to the B operator in the Plaza Central office. B assigns her a trunk, testing Mr. Townsend's line at the same instant. Finding that it is not busy, she plugs in on this jack. A, in the meantime, plugs in on the other end of the trunk line assigned. This completes the circuit and automatically causes Mr. Townsend's bell to ring. Mr. Townsend takes up the receiver and answers with his number, speaking directly into the mouthpiece of the transmitter. He speaks in a low voice, but always talks with a smile. Hello, Jimmy, he hears. This is Bob. Oh, hello, Bob. What's the news? Helen's giving a little dinner and theater party tonight for her sister, Mrs. Turner of Baltimore, who's sailing on the Mauritania. We want you and Mrs. Townsend to meet her. Can you join us? We'll be delighted to, old man. All right, that's fine. Awfully glad you can come. About six-thirty, up at the house. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mr. Townsend hangs up. Mr. Douglas hangs up. PBX sees by her white signal that Mr. Douglas is through with the line and takes down the cords. A and B disconnect as usual. The clock points to eleven-eleven. It is just one minute since Mr. Douglas finished speaking to Dr. Ripley, but in that minute he has talked with another friend four miles away, and has invited two more guests to his party. And now I had better get a hold of Jack Harrison, Mr. Douglas says to himself. Mr. Harrison lives in Albany, but it is nearly as easy to get a man on the long-distance telephone as it is to get a man just around the corner. Mr. Douglas calls his offices in Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, and Philadelphia every day. He is almost constantly using a long-distance telephone as a business getter, and so he picks up his receiver with the same unconcern as though he were calling Plaza or Tremont instead of a city a hundred and more miles away. Long distance, please, he says to PBX when she has plugged in, and asks, number please, as usual. PBX now plugs in to reach A, and asks for long distance. A plugs in to one of the long-distance trunks on her board. This puts Mr. Douglas in direct connection with the long-distance recorder. The long-distance operating room is in many ways the most interesting in the whole building. Here sit three hundred or more girls, each one handling calls, in much the same way as any other operator does. All of this switchboard work is done with practically no noise. The whole switchboard room, in fact, is operated so quietly that a stranger would hardly guess how important the work is that these operators are doing. The long-distance recorder takes down the details of the call as Mr. Douglas gives them. Mr. Douglas's name and his telephone number, Mr. Harrison's name and address in Albany, all these go down on a special ticket which is arranged to facilitate the putting through of the call. Mr. Douglas is to be called when Mr. Harrison is on the wire and ready to talk. Mr. Douglas accordingly hangs up. In order that Mr. Douglas's telephone may be kept free from interruptions, the long-distance recorder orders up his number, 43250, on the B board of the Spring Central office. In other words, she tells the B operator to plug into Mr. Douglas's line in order that no other calls may be made on that wire until the Albany call is completed. The line will be held up long enough to allow time for putting through the call, not more than ten minutes as a rule. B assigns long distance a trunk line, and the long distance recorder plugs into this jack. All of this is done instantly. 
The recorder now puts the ticket, bearing the details of the call, into a pneumatic tube, which brings it immediately to the distributing operator. All the messenger work in the long-distance room is done by means of pneumatic tubes. This permits quick and noiseless communication between the operators who take care of the calls at the various stages, and avoids the necessity of moving around to reach another operator in another part of the building. The distributing operator notes that Mr. Harrison's telephone number is not given as yet on the ticket. She therefore sends the ticket on to the directory operator, who looks up Mr. Harrison in the Albany directory, and adds the missing details in their proper places. All of this preliminary work is made necessary in order that there may be no delay or lost time when Albany Central is finally called. It would have facilitated getting the connection had Mr. Douglas been able to give this Albany number to the long-distance recorder. Long-distance conversation is valued at so much a minute. With the tremendous number of long-distance calls being handled daily, it is essential that no time be wasted on any call after the long-distance wire is put into operation. The ticket is complete now, and the directory operator sends it back through the tube to the distributing operator. The distributing operator sees that the call is ready to be put through. She therefore drops the ticket into another slot, which conveys it directly to the operator at the Albany section of the New York switchboard. This operator is called, for the sake of convenience, the New York to Albany operator. The New York to Albany operator notes Mr. Douglas's number on the ticket and plugs in the trunk to which his line is connected, in order that she may call him directly when she has made the proper connection with Albany. The trunk line number was put on the ticket by the recorder. This action, which connects the long-distance switchboard to the original A board, lights the signal lamp on the board in front of the long-distance recorder, who sees that Mr. Douglas's line is now being held properly by the New York to Albany operator. The long-distance recorder accordingly pulls out the plug with which she has been holding his line. Her part of the work is now done. The New York to Albany operator is now ready to call Albany. This she does by taking the cord in front of the one which connects back to Mr. Douglas's line, and plugging into one of the Albany trunks. By operating a ringing key associated with this cord, she signals to the Albany operator. Albany, therefore, plugs in and takes the number, main 23750. Mr. Harrison is to be called to the telephone before the final connection is made. The Albany operator presses a call circuit button, which connects her with the B operator in the main central office, and asks for Mr. Harrison's number. This part of the operation is already familiar to the reader. The B operator assigns a trunk to the Albany operator and tests Mr. Harrison's line. Finding that it is not busy, she plugs into it with the trunk she has assigned. The Albany operator takes up this trunk, thereby completing the circuit between New York and Mr. Harrison's wire. The B board in the main central office in Albany is very much the same as the B boards we have already seen. In fact, the telephone equipment has been everywhere so improved and standardized that the switchboard equipment in various cities differs very little from the equipment described here, except in size and the number of subscribers it will accommodate. As soon as the B operator in Albany plugs in on the jack leading to Mr. Harrison's telephone, his bell rings automatically. Mr. Harrison answers the telephone at once and speaks directly to the New York long-distance operator, who tells him New York is calling Mr. Harrison. While Mr. Harrison holds the wire, the New York to Albany operator operates the ringing key on her board and calls PBX. Ready with Mr. Harrison at Albany, she says, when PBX answers. PBX plugs in on Mr. Douglas's extension and presses the button that brings him to the telephone. Mr. Douglas and Mr. Harrison are ready now, each at his end of the wire. Mr. Douglas speaks first as he is making the call. Hello, Jack. Mr. Douglas's voice sounds so natural that Mr. Harrison recognizes it at once. Come on down this afternoon on the two o'clock train. We're having a little party tonight, and we want you and Mrs. Jack to be there. Mr. Harrison thanks him heartily for the invitation, but explains to him that he will be unable to come. So, after a brief conversation, they both hang up. 
The record of the call is then completed, and all of the operators disconnect as usual. The clock on Mr. Douglas's desk shows that it took him four minutes to get Albany and three minutes to carry on the conversation. It is now 11.18. Guess I'll skip Spence Norman. Helen will invite him. Now for the theater tickets. He knows that Mrs. Douglas will make good use of the residence telephone if any further plans have to be made. For in the social world and the sphere of activity around the home, the telephone is as great a time-saver as it is in the business world. Mr. Douglas lifts his receiver. Number, please, asks PBX when she has plugged in on his line. Bryant 33000, please. That is the number we will use for the casino theater. PBX plugs in. A answers and takes the number, Bryant 33000, and passes it on to the B operator in the Bryant central office. When B tests the line, she hears a peculiar sound, which indicates to her that the telephone at the theater is out of order. So instead of completing the connection with the theater, she plugs in on the trouble jack. This connects Mr. Douglas with the trouble operator in the Bryant central office. The trouble operator, just like trouble back in the plaza central office, sits at a position on the B board. All the subscribers' lines in the Bryant district are represented there in thousands of little holes or jacks in the board before her. She can thus test any line in the office by plugging into the proper jack on her board. Trouble answers and learns that Mr. Douglas is calling Bryant 33000. By means of trouble-detecting apparatus which is wired to her position, she finds that the line being called is temporarily out of order. It is open, broken. In fact, Bryant 33000 has just been reported to her for trouble, and is now on an out-of-order cord, which gives the out-of-order test to other operators in the Bryant central office who may wish to call this line. She reports the line out-of-order to Mr. Douglas, who hangs up. PBX accordingly disconnects her cords as usual. Trouble then signals A in Spring central office by working her signaling key back and forth, and telling A that Bryant 33000 is out of order. Trouble, just before this, has made a trouble memorandum, giving the number of the line, the time, the trouble, and such other information as is necessary. This memorandum she rolls into a small leather cylinder provided for the purpose, which she drops into a delivery tube at her side. A moment later this cylinder with the trouble memorandum drops out on the desk of the wire chief's clerk. The wire chief is responsible for the mechanical end of the telephone central office. The wiring, the dynamos, the storage batteries, the cables and fuses. He is a master electrician and directs a corps of trained men who repair any injury to the wires or instruments as soon as it is reported. A squad of outside trouble men attend to the accidents which affect the wires outside of the central office. These men telephone to the wire chief at half-hour intervals to report in and get new assignments of lines which are out of order. The wire chief now makes a second memorandum of the trouble which has been reported about the theater telephone. This memorandum he holds on file for his own record. The original trouble memorandum is endorsed with his signature and the time of its receipt. It is subsequently returned to its originating point to be filed there. In the meantime, the wire chief makes a test of his instrument, and when the outside trouble man telephones in, from some public telephone in the square mile or so of territory covered by this central office, the wire chief gives him the number and address of the theater telephone and the details of the trouble. The outside trouble man makes a note of these details on his pad. The trouble, as stated in the blank, is that the line is open, in other words, it is broken. The outside trouble man hangs up his receiver, and a moment later he is at the corner of Broadway and 39th Street. To locate the trouble, he inspects the telephone, not from the inside, but from the outside. He begins by connecting with the wire by means of a small pocket telephone which he carries with him, together with the tools needed in making repairs to the wires and instruments. He finds that the insulation has worn off in one place where the scenery has been rubbed up against the wall and the wires that run along it. 
the damage was slight but it was sufficient to break the circuit and throw the subscriber's line out of commission the outside trouble man quickly makes the necessary repairs and reconnects the wire he then re-insulates the wire by binding adhesive tape tightly around the place which had been scraped bare then he inspects the line thoroughly to see that nothing else is wrong he makes sure that all parts of the line are once more in perfect working order before he leaves the premises then he telephones to the wire chief over the theater wire the wire chief tests the repaired line and tells him that everything is now okay the voltmeter an instrument which the wire chief has for testing lines indicates that the line is all right again the outside trouble man accordingly leaves the theater and goes to another telephone a few blocks away which is in trouble the wire chief in the meanwhile has told trouble to take down the out of order cord from jack three three o o o the line bryant three three o o o is now o k and calls may be completed both to and from it mr douglas has been reading his mail during the fifteen minutes since he found the theater telephone was out of order now he lifts his receiver to try calling the theater again his private switchboard operator pbx plugs in the usual way and passes on the number bryant three three o o to the a operator the board in front of her the private branch exchange switchboard is a small-sized replica of the a board simplified in some details to permit of its being used by operators who have less technical experience than the a and b were required to have before they became operators for a and b had to go to school at headquarters before they were given their present positions as operators they are graduates of the telephone operators school maintained by the company pbx's switchboard merely passes on outgoing calls to the a operator in spring central office a passes the call on to the b operator in the bryant central office and b promptly assigns a trunk and tests the line being called the line is not busy so she plugs in a in the meantime plugs in on the trunk assigned and the connection is completed with the telephone in the theater box office the bell rings casino theater says the box office man taking up the receiver this answer indicates at once to mr douglas that he has the right number he speaks directly have you a box for eight for tonight he asks box for eight yes give you box a a on the right what's the name please mr douglas orders the tickets to be held in his name until he can send a boy for them he has long used the convenient telephone method of arranging for theater tickets assured now of the theater tickets mr douglas hangs up his receiver pbx draws out the plugs and lets them fall back into place the box office man hangs up a sees the disconnect lamp light and knows that the call is completed so she takes down the connection b also disconnects mr douglas now turns to his day's work the party has been arranged definitely the guests have been invited the dinner has been ordered and the tickets have been provided for he takes up his work with the satisfaction of one who has done much with the aid of the telephone during the rest of his busy day his work is made lighter and smoother by the use of the telephone and mrs douglas at home is saving time at her end of the wire by using the telephone soon after six the guests begin to arrive thanks to the ever helpful telephone jimmy townsend and mrs jimmy and doc ripley and his wife and spence norman and the guest of honor mrs charles pickard turner mrs douglas's sister are all there and a jolly party it is indeed the telephone at the eleventh hour brought them all together and the story of how it helped to make the party a success is ended but the work at the telephone central office goes right on day and night when the day operators go home for the night other operators come to take their places the telephone never sleeps every night after midnight all the subscribers lines in every central office are tested carefully the night tester watches the voltmeter as he connects with every one of the jacks on the board in front of him he can detect any kind of electrical trouble instantly if anything is wrong he makes out a detailed report of the trouble this is a picture of the night tester's report every number that is out of order is crossed off as soon as the trouble has been repaired 
Every telephone operator in every central office is trained in the subject of telephony, so that she thoroughly understands the operation of the telephone system. These young women are carefully selected, and after they have become employees of the telephone company, every care is taken to provide for their comfort and efficiency. The telephone company in all of the large cities has its own schools for operators, where they are taught the principles of switchboard operation, and later on are given lessons in actual switchboard work in the school practice room. These pictures show the study room, the lecture room, and the practice room. There is also a pleasant rest room for operators in every central office. Mr. Douglas's jolly party, arranged at the eleventh hour, would have been almost impossible but for the help of the telephone and the operators whose watchword is the voice with the smile wins end of the eleventh hour by the new york telephone company read by maria casper